Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this LinkedIn Live. We'll be talking about seizing everyday negotiation opportunities. And uh, I have the pleasure to have with me Susan Dianish and a professor at George Mason in the US. And we will uh, understand, you know, I will ask her to introduce herself. But before, before we go into uh, the topic and uh, in our uh, special guest for today, how about discovering about a bit more about our audience? You know, I know that a number of you will be watching the event uh, on a recorded basis, so a bit uh, later, but uh, how about the ones that are joining us live today? Where are you based? Thank you, Muhammad, for giving us uh, the first sign. Now, uh, where are you based? Are we going to have more people uh, in the US, more people in Europe. I mean, uh, Susan, I mean, she, she will tell us a bit more, but she also was a professor at IMD in Lausanne. That's where I had the pleasure to meet, to meet her, collaborate with her. We wrote also a number of articles. So, but uh, let's try to understand a bit more about our audience. And uh, end of the day in Europe, lunchtime East Coast, start of the day in the West Coast. Uh, probably a bit too late for the people in Asia, so I doubt that we're going to get many people over there. But uh, do give us a sign so that uh, we have a better idea. Okay. Here we oh, Mori. Hello, Mori. Great to, to see you again. And uh, sitting in Europe for the time being. Fantastic. Fantastic. So, uh, what well, as a as uh, the communication keeps going uh, and the, the feed, the the channel, feed, there is a bit of delay in the in the channel. But uh, how about uh, as we wait for uh, more chats messages from the participants, uh, if we ask Suzanne to tell us a bit more about herself? Sure. Thank you, Giuseppe. Well, as you mentioned, I am currently a professor at George Mason University with a joint appointment. So I teach in the business school, but I also teach in the Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution. I often say it's not a 50-50 job, it's a 75-75, you do the math. <laughs> but I also do quite a bit of consulting and executive education around the world, um, physically and often, uh, especially thanks to the pandemic, virtually. And one of the areas I have been specializing in lately and has been really, really important to organizations who are scrambling to uh, recognize and take steps to improve the diversity, equity, and inclusion in their organizations, women in a negotiation. And so I've written extensively in the area, and I have been teaching a lot of executive women. In fact, I got one more second. Um, you know, I, I love that. I love working with executives from around the world, but I started thinking why do we wait that long? Why do we wait until women are in their 30s or 40s or 50s to kind of get over some of the fears that they have? And so about a week ago, I did a session for about 100 high school girls here in the local area. And it was wonderful. It was, I think for many of them, transformative, just answering questions that they have been thinking about. And so it, it's a, I think we need to really address this issue at a far more systemic level. Amazing. I love this idea of doing something for the high school students, maybe give you some food for thought, you know, I may have also to give some contribution also in Europe, by the way, I'm based in Switzerland, you know, that's what you see on the background is the, the city of Nyon between Geneva and Lausanne. Okay, now let's, uh, let's go to the topic of the day. It is based on a recent article that Suzanne has published on Harvard Business Review. Seizing everyday negotiation opportunities is the topic. Now, you mentioned in your article that many people fail, fail to recognize or capitalize on negotiation opportunities. What explains that? Let me take one step backwards. You know, for anybody who has taken a negotiation seminar or class in university, we start with prepare, right? get your data, get ready to negotiate your salary based on the data that you've collected. And I started realizing that if people don't even recognize opportunities, 
what's to prepare, right? So we have to take a couple of steps backward. But to that, I think for many people, there are things that they don't recognize are actually negotiable. I mean, take, for instance, our consumer roles, whether it's products or services, the price is the price, or is it? So that's one thing. Um, I think some people just don't believe that even if they think something is negotiable, that they don't have the ability to influence the outcome. And then the last thing is the stress that some people feel in thinking about this, oh my gosh, you know, can I actually do this? It's not worth the stress. It's not worth the effort. Forget about it. Mm, well, I mean, let me build on this idea of the stress, right? You know, because, okay, many people avoid conflict, right? But uh, why is that? And how does that impact uh, individuals' professional and personal relationships and opportunities? <laughs> Maybe a bit of a long spend, question, but, you yeah, know. Yeah, we could spend hours <laughs> talking about that, that, Giuseppe. I think, first of all, most people want to be liked, right? We don't want to be rejected, whether we're talking about colleagues or loved ones. And we mistakenly feel that if we push back, if we call someone on their behavior, they treated us improperly or, or spoke to us in a way that we didn't feel good, we just kind of go, oh, that didn't feel good. And we, we leave it alone, thinking that it'll go away. And we all know that it doesn't go away. Or we send those telekinetic messages, please don't speak to me that way anymore. And that doesn't work either. Now, interestingly, there's been tons of research. It's not just in our heads. Our bodies react to conflict. Our hearts race, our blood pressure increases. We grind our teeth. Uh, our skin starts to sweat in our hands and our palms. And so, again, if you think about the feeling that our bodies experience when we recognize this conflict, some of it's fight or flight, but some of it is just, ugh. I think I'll just walk away or I'll have a glass of wine and I'm not going to worry about it anymore. So it's it's not, you know, we, we want to be liked and we actually feel uncomfortable when we recognize those conflicts. Mm -hmm. Now, but you're not suggesting that we should negotiate every opportunity, right? You know, are you? I mean, uh, I mean, if you save 25% on a pair of shoes, it's not that big of a deal. Well, exactly. And, and so one of the things that I talk about in this pa uh, paper is that there are lots and lots of opportunities all around us in our personal lives, in our professional lives. And some of it, I think, starts off with recognizing, is this situation fair? So, for example, in the workplace, uh, is somebody else getting the credit for work that you've done? Is somebody else getting promoted when you've saved the company thousands or millions of euro or dollars, right? Um, is what's happening really feeling fair to you? Do you deserve more or better or faster? So for example, you have your cable company providing internet and you notice that in your friend's house, it's much quicker and they're even paying less. Can I have this conversation with the supplier? And if so, what are, what are the possibilities? Another question I ask people to think about is, if this other party offered me a better deal, faster, more fair, more equitable, would I take it? I know that's a silly question, but right? So if they're reading my mind and they make this offer to me, that's a no brainer. But my next question is, would a more confident version of me ask? right? That one should make all of us squirm a little bit, right? Because we see sometimes these situations where it's not so fair and we are like, ah, I wish, but what if we were more confident or when we imagine ourselves in that moment where we are our most confident, would we have asked? And how do you kind of bring that up? And so again, you know this, you're an expert negotiator. It's not just about money. It's not just about benefits in an organization. A lot of it is our relationship with our partners and the allocation of chores. Um, it's whether or not we're getting a, a fair deal from a supplier of, you know, in, in the workplace or, you know, in our own home and our consumers. So, um, so now going back to your question though, when we recognize these opportunities, 
which which are the ones that would have the greatest impact, right? So um, if you drive several miles to get a lower price per gallon by a few pennies or centime, it's not worth it, <laughs> right? Or maybe, as you said, 25% off a pair of shoes. Maybe it's not worth it. But what if it's 25% off a, an appliance that's several thousand dollars? Or what if it's your salary, which as we know, it, you know, over time exponentially grows. So those choices we make are really important or the price of a house. So it's important to recognize and evaluate, is it worth it? But if we say no to all of that, we are not, we're not working out our negotiation muscle and it atrophies. And we'll, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that. So yeah, we have to recognize them, but we also have to decide what's the payoff. Okay. Now I want to build a bit more on one of your comments, you know, the confidence piece. Mm -hmm. So do you have a trick on that one? You know, that's, uh, is there something that can uh, help us, you know, leverage that point? Absolutely. So of course, one of the best ways to build our confidence is to do our homework, right? Know what we know, know what we're talking about. It's not, I want more, but rather I have done the research. I know that others in this position, uh, in this company or in this industry, in this geographic region are making seven to 12% more than I'm making. So knowing your data makes you more composed and more able to present it in a more confident way. Another thing I tell my students and participants to think about is as corny as some people feel about role plays, they're super important, right? So if you have the experience, even if it's just in a role play of meeting this difficult boss or having this conversation, uh, asking for a big discount on a, you know, an appliance, if we have that experience of going through it, we, we create that muscle memory. And it's not the first time we're negotiating it, so to speak, when we actually get there. So that's another way to increase our confidence. Fantastic. By the way, let me take also a quick comment from one of the participants, Sergio, an experienced negotiator. By the way, you know, I learned only 10 years ago that they can negotiate the car insurance renewal, right? You know, so yes, the, you, you may not realize, you know, all the opportunities which are there for uh, negotiation. Now, one point before we move to the next question, and I want to inform our listener about a couple of opportunities to continue the learning journey and to do something in the space of negotiation. And the first is our next LinkedIn Life. Our next LinkedIn Life is about becoming a master negotiator with Remy Smoliski, 22nd of November at one o'clock. You know, Remy has been running a competition for students for the last 15 years in order to see who, which students wins the negotiation competition, which calls, you know, for uh, going, doing some deep research about, you know, about how can you measure who is the best negotiator? What are the elements that make you a maximum negotiator? So do not miss this opportunity to join Remy on the 22nd of November at one o'clock. And the other element still linked to the same topic is that we are going to have a competition, Master Negotiator Award 2023 in January, we will do a negotiation competition. So what you can do, you cannot uh, apply yourself, but you can choose somebody that you know, that you believe is a great negotiator. So, you know, rather than uh, a self-promotional kind of things, we decided to use the approach of uh, think about a colleague, a supplier, a customer, the boss, that uh, you look at a role model as a negotiator. And then you, you quickly follow this link and you can recommend somebody else to be the person that should be considered for this uh, competition. The competition will take place in January. And then, you know, apart from winning the competition, you also get access to our strategic negotiation masterclass in June. Okay. Now, with that in mind, you know, let's go back to today's because, you know, at the beginning of this event, Susanne, you mentioned something that is very interesting to a lot of people. Your work, the work that you do with women. 
So, you know, since you work a lot with women negotiators, then what challenges to negotiation are unique to them? So it starts off very, very young. We are socialized to behave a certain way. And what I mean by socialized is we see modeled for us by other people what seems to be okay and what is not okay. So for example, how many women on this call have stood up for themselves and been called aggressive or worse, the B word, right? Whereas if a man were to exhibit the same behavior, he's a leader. And so we know that men on average negotiate four times more often than their female counterparts. There's research that shows this. There's even research that suggests about 20% of adult women never negotiate at all. So everything that's given to them, whether it's a job offer or the price, okay, that's it. And so because women are socialized to be collaborative and soft and you know, not make waves and not kind of beat their chest and look at me and look at how great I am, many women just don't negotiate or don't do so with confidence or as some of my current research is showing, they will accept an offer lower than they had prepared for in the first place, despite their research and their confidence. Like, oh, okay, because again, I don't want to be um, rejected. I want to be liked. Um, we also know, for example, that despite the fact that more and more women-owned businesses are being created, less than 3% of venture capital is going to women-owned businesses. And I'm not blaming women, please, <laughs> right? There are lots of factors, lots of biases that get into this. So I really enjoy working with women. I was like that when I was younger as well, that I just didn't either have the confidence or I was afraid that if I spoke up, I would not get the job, I wouldn't be liked. In fact, let me tell you one more study that was done that suggested that women who negotiate their starting salary as compared to women who did not negotiate their starting salary are more respected, but less liked. Mm -hmm. Yikes, right? So again, it's not just these fears that ir are irrational, they are, you know, it's changing. I'd like to think in the workforce and as more people learn and understand how to interact with people who may be different from them, I mean, there's also neurodiversity, but people who are different from them to recognize and make easier the ability for people to speak up and say, hey, I'm doing much more percentage of the work as a member of this team than others, I need to speak up because I'm not able to do the work well because I'm so spread out on so many tasks. Mm -hmm. Listen, there is a question from uh, Ilse that, uh, let's see, so let's let's get it. So they will always ask, are you angry? No, if you think <laughs> I'm mad because I'm standing up for myself, then you already know what the issue is. Right, well, you know. <laughs> Ilsa, thank you. That's a great question. And by the way, as much blowback as women face when they stand up for themselves, women of color face even more, right? Because of the stereotypes that, oh, angry black woman. Um, and so I'd like, you know, I'm going to take your question at face value that the people who ask this question are just falling prey to these stereotypes. However, in addition, there is research that suggests how we ask can make a difference. So one quick example, research that suggests that women who negotiate on behalf of, like reframing the ask. So I am not asking for me, but I'm asking on behalf of my department. We need to get greater funding in order for our department to be able to meet these deadlines. And of course, that's a little bit harder when you're having a one-on-one -on -one salary negotiation, but um, I've written a few pieces that kind of speak to what are some specific strategies or tactics women can use to reduce the likelihood of that blowback. Hope that helped. Fantastic. Amazing. Now, to close our event, I mean, uh, how about uh, what advice can you offer to women in particular when it comes to negotiating? Where do I start? 
<laughs> well, I mean, let's go back to um, these these fears and these biases. I mean, first of all, it's a good idea to recognize what is keeping you from taking these opportunities, engaging in negotiations that are not even about money, talking with your partner. You know, for example, there's a lot of research that suggests the great resignation was primarily women. And I think that some of that was due to taking on so much more of the extra work in their homes that they just couldn't manage the workplace as well as manage the home. Um, so we need to be able for women to be able to speak up and say, hey, this isn't OK. And so one of the pieces of advice, again, is to recognize some of the things that I've talked about, our fears, our biases are, are not establishing credibility because we're afraid to brag on ourselves. So recognize which of these behaviors are you perhaps falling prey to? Another really important thing is, you know, Giuseppe, you asked me the question about the shoes, right? Now, you may think that's not worth it. But again, here's the thing. If we don't practice these everyday opportunities, calling the cable company and asking for a discount or talking with your spouse or partner about reallocating the chores, what makes us think that when the big negotiations come up, we're gonna feel comfortable and confident? Remember, we're all uncomfortable physically when it comes to conflict. So the more we do something, the less scary it is the more confident we can approach it. So that's not just women, that's everyone. Amazing. Perfect. So I guess that uh, remember, you know, a call to action is something that uh, may be relevant uh, for everyone. So if we want to capture this uh, to summarize in one action, you know, the seizing everyday opportunity is, you know, look at the everyday opportunities also as a way to practice your negotiation skills so that when the bigger opportunity comes, you will have your muscle trained and you will be able to do great negotiation. Well said. Susan, it was a pleasure to have you here. And uh, thank you very much to everyone for joining this uh, workshop. Thank you also for the one that uh, will be jo will be watching the recording at a later stage and look forward to reconnect with you for our next LinkedIn Live, 22nd of November at one o'clock, becoming a master negotiator. And if you feel that uh, you know somebody that is a great master, great negotiator already and should be going for our competition, the master negotiator award are up there and we are taking subscription until the 9th of December. So do check uh, the message in the chat and let us know who should be the master negotiator for 2023. Susan, thanks again. Thank you to our audience and uh, all the very best. Take care. It's been my pleasure. Thank you.